Welcome to Whiskey and Wool. This is my Knitter's Life series, season two, episode seven <laughs> for this season. Uh, yeah, so my season starts in January and goes to December and then we do it all over again. It's a nice way to bookmark the ends. How are you? I hope you are well. I hope you are healthy. And if it is spring where you are, I hope you're enjoying a little bit more mild temperatures, whatever that means. Mild is a relative term. <laughs> um, here, we're actually having, I mean, I was out in a t-shirt earlier today, um, but pants. I probably could have worn shorter pants, crop pants, whatever. Anyway, yes, it's quite mild. Um, I know some folks are having snow uh, this weekend in in uh, in the United States and probably parts of Canada or whatever. So yeah, sorry, sorry for you. Warmer days are coming if you're in the northern hemisphere. Colder days if you're in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> well, so. Uh, I have quite a lot to show you. Um, I finished, I have three finished objects and a couple new cast-ons to go through. Um, it doesn't feel like a lot, but probably recording will take a while. Um, so I am going to start today off with uh, what I usually do, which will be a whiskey chat I will be filming later on this evening. Uh, yeah. I think I know what I'm going to do, but who knows, might change between now and then, <laughs> but go ahead and watch. And if you are not interested in watching the whiskey chat, I will tell you where to skip to so you can get straight into hearing about my finished objects. <laughs> um, if you're new here, whiskey chats take about 10 minutes usually, and it is a little uh, tasting and giving you some background info about the production of uh, whichever whiskey I happen to be tasting, whiskey or gin. I also have been mixing in gins from time to time. Ooh, I have a new gin. It may be a gin chat. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you where to skip to. I'm gonna do a little gin chat for you today. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was a little indecisive earlier. I remembered in the middle of recording that I got a new gin to try uh, Hendrix Lunar. Um, let me get that closer for you so you can take a look. This is part of, if you're familiar with Hendrix, they are a Scottish um, gin company, which I'm gonna tell you about in a minute. So it's bottled in Scotland. They have what they call a Cabinet of Curiosities series. Um, so that includes Lunar, Orborium and Midsummer. Um, so my local uh, shop had Lunar and or Orbium. I think I'm saying that right. Um, all right. I have my little tasting glass um, pre-poured with an ounce and uh, a splash of water. Um, when you're tasting either whiskey or gin, that is the way to taste it. You put a couple drops of water in it to help open up the fragrance and tastes um, in the in the in the glass. And you use a this is a tasting um, oh my goodness, it just dram <laughs> a tasting dram. The word just went out of my head. Um, yeah, uh, I I also showered. Uh, my hair was looking so greasy in some of those <laughs> put in some of the footage I was looking at and I was just really really hot so yes I've showered and changed I'm wearing a Shelly can sheep and wool sheep and wool t-shirt from Rhinebeck from I don't know many years ago um, it's one of my favorites though I just love it uh, yeah so we are uh, going to taste oh sorry um little action over by the bird feeder <laughs> i have my window open too now because it's quite warm um okay so let me tell you a little bit about hendrix if you're not familiar they are a um a small operation under the william s grant company 
William S. Grant was established in the 1880s. They are primarily a whiskey maker. In fact, if they sound familiar, I have talked about them before. Uh, they own Balvenie. Uh, they own Glen Glenfiddich. They own Tellamore Distillery in Ireland. Uh, they own a distillery in Dufftown, uh, Con Valmore, which I haven't talked about, uh, and a couple others. The distillery that um, makes Hendrick is located in, um, I'm, I hope I'm saying this right, My, I have a couple Scottish viewers who I think will help me out. Uh, it is a, in a tiny little seaside town called Gervan or Jervan. I'm going to put it on screen. I'll also put a map with the locator so you can see where exactly it's on the west coast of Scotland. Um, so Hendrix was established in 1999. I, I thought it was around forever. If you look at any artwork and things that they have, like marketing material, artwork for the marketing material, they have like sort of this like turn of the century vibe to them, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, I guess it's hearkening back to the William Grant um, roots of this business. Um, yeah. Anyway, the Cabinet of Curiosity line started just a couple years ago. Um, I have tried, I purchased the Arborium uh, a couple years ago. It's good. Hendrix, though, by and large, is a pretty expensive gin. Um, it retails, this bottle is supposed to retail for around 40. I think I paid slightly more than that from my local guy. Um, you know, everything's going up, inflation, uh, due to supply chain issues and all of that. Um, but anyway, <laughs> let's keep it on. Jen, um, so there's a couple things that Hendrix is known for. They have a female master distiller, um, and her name is Leslie, hang on. Oh my goodness, I don't remember her last name. I'll pop it on screen here, <laughs> this screen here. Um, yeah, so they, and a picture of her as well. Um, yeah, so she, that's one thing. The second thing is that it's known for putting rose in their regular, you know, Hendrix um, bottles. So, and the variations seem to have different, you know, forward flavors and such. So I'm excited to uh, taste this one and see what the forward flavor. Oh, it's Leslie Gracie. Um, I just had to click on a screen and and get there. Yeah, so, oh, and the place where the gin is distilled is called the Hendrix Gin Palace, which I love that name, and it's beautiful. Uh, I will put a couple pictures here on it. Um, it is not open to the public, though. Um, also, they say that they talk about distilling with two different still types. Um, one is used for an overnight soak, and then um, the actual distillation process happens in a, in another, um, still, as far as I can tell. Of course, like whiskey producers, gen producers, maybe even more so, are very secretive about their processes and don't really, um, get into the ingredients that they use and all of that. Um, being a UK gin, we know that there has to be a certain amount of juniper in it and that it is likely that uh, juniper will be a fairly strong flavor in the gin. Um, because that's part of UK rule about or law about what, in order to be called a gin, it must have, a, you know, hit certain criteria. Uh, okay. So let me, oh my gosh, I can smell it. It smells so good. I'm going to go ahead and give it a taste. And then I'm going to tell you what I found um, from professional tasters about what they thought. It's very clear. I actually saw a picture of a gin that was blue. Um, I haven't tried that one. Or purple. There's a purple one too. It smells, um, it smells like flowers and a little bit of citrus. I don't really get the piney juniper 
smell? Hmm. Or, like just floral and citrus, really, on the nose. Wow, okay. That's what I taste as well, just floral and citrus. There's definitely juniper though in the middle. And there's a spice at the end, like a spiciness. It might be like cumin or coriander, like one of those spices that reminds me a little bit of almost like curry, but I know curry's a blend has something like that. I don't think it's rose. The floral. It's so it starts with for me. It starts with floral. Then there's some juniper and citrus and then it ends with a spice. So, let's see what the experts say about it. Um, I often use Flavier as my um, tasting notes site. So they did taste it. They say eclectic floral aroma with a touch of citrus. <laughs> I got that right. Um, warm notes mingling with freshness, floral no notes galore, and then delicate spicy finish. But do they tell you... Hang on. Oh yeah, I found a flavor spiral. Okay, great. I'll put that on screen for you. Um, so floral without really saying what flower, rose it comes after that, then cucumber, citrus, spice, but not they're not identifying the spice. Oh, coriander and juniper at the end. Yeah, it's really good. Okay, I did go to another site too. Uh, okay. On the nose, honeysuckle, dusty violet, sitting atop of piney juniper and coriander with an indistinct spice. On the palate, predominantly floral, soapy violet with jasmine facets. It settles into a surprisingly spice-led heart of juniper and black peppercorns, pink lady apple and roses. Um, and last, it a glow of honeysuckle flowers, musky rose, and a touch of their signature cucumber. They recommend, um, this site is recommending that it says that it makes a very nice mixer, um, such as a gin and tonic. It would also make a really good Negroni or Martini. Um, I, my go-to is kind of a my own bend, my own take on a gin and tonic. I've talked about this before, but I'll share it again. Um, I do gin and seltzer or club soda, um, and I put a dash of bitters in it if the if it needs it. So and then t that gives you that tonic taste without the sugar that comes in tonic. And I hate the taste of diet anything diet soda. Like I hate the taste of artificial sweeteners so I just never never use them um, I'd rather go without um, but yeah this will be really great I have papers to grade so this evening so I will pour myself a glass of um, I'll do the gin and seltzer blend and maybe a slice of lime and take it from there um, Thank you so much for listening and watching. I hope you enjoyed the um, Hendrix tasting. I hope you get a chance to try a refreshing drink of your own. And I'll see you next time. All right. So welcome back. Um, as I said, we're having some mild weather. I, I should have opened the window because um, it would have been a little cooler. I guess I could open that one. I might end up taking the sweater off. I think I can make it through the episode, but um, yeah. So I finished my daily pullover by Paula Pereira. Um, it is a pattern offered by Pearl Soho. Knit out of linen quill, which is, oh, I have the tag even, which is a Pearl Soho yarn. If you watch, um, there we go. It is uh, Highland wool, 50% Highland wool, 35% alpaca, 15% linen. Um, if you watch Caddy Jack's knits 
and pretty much half of the other knitting YouTube channels, you'll have learned or heard about this yarn. Um, I knit mine out of Kettle Black. And what you'll see, you can see quite well in the black, is that the linen is undyed and creates this heathered effect. So that, that happens in the other colors too, but the high, it's higher contrast in the black. Um, yeah, so I've been wanting to try this yarn since uh, 2020 when Caddy Jacks talked about the half and half triangle wrap. Um, but I just couldn't, I couldn't swallow having to buy six skeins to make that project. So I used yarn that I had out of my stash. I just, I have a big stash. Um, it feels big to me. It's probably not big compared to most people's, but it feels big. It feels a little overwhelming looking at it. So I'm trying really hard to knit from my stash um, this year and having a low buy in terms of yarn and fiber. Um, yeah, so more about that in December, how I did. I've, so far, I think I'm doing pretty good. Um, anyway, uh, this was this was very simple knit. It's just a stockinette style. You, um, you do a provisional cast on for the back neck and sleeves, and then you build the front. Um, so you're working back and forth uh, in stockinette increasing slowly increasing along the front neck edge until you reach basically the bottom of the v and the armholes happen around the same time at least it did for my size i think there might be some variability depending on what size you're making and you um then join in the round and knit all the way in the round and then you put your sleeve you're putting your sleeves on waist yarn and then knitting each sleeve but um yeah, I love it. This is exactly the way I wanted it to come out to turn out. I did make it a bit longer, um, and I still have probably about almost 40% of the skein left. I had three skeins total for my size. I think I knit the size large or the fourth size. I usually knit third or fourth size. I think it was meant to have like a 44 or so inch, um, 42 maybe inch uh, bust. Um, my bust line, it measures 39 and a half, so there's quite a lot of extra ease. I didn't get gauge. <laughs> I was looser. My gauge was looser. And I just decided to not fiddle with the numbers and have another disappointing outcome. And I just decided to knit the size as if I got the size that that uh, Paula recommended in the pattern and um, have a bigger baggier more positive ease fit and I love it. It is exactly what I wanted um, and I made it longer. I'm gonna put a picture on, I probably already did, of me wearing it, not styled, it's just gonna be me, a picture of me that I'm gonna take as soon as I'm done recording. <laughs> Um, I have been wearing it nonstop since I got it off the needles and off the blocking mat about two days ago. So um, because it's so easy to wear, it's just a v-neck. It's a plain v-neck. It's black. I love to wear black. I have a ton of black in my wardrobe. Um, not too many black sweaters, though. Well, I do have some black sweaters, but this is the only black sweater that I've knit. Um, I've sort of steered clear of black because uh, it is hard to see. And I did have some trouble seeing it in the evenings, especially when I was, I think I mentioned this last time, when I was visiting a friend who likes to watch movies at night in the dark. Uh, yeah, impossible, even though I was doing just in the round. I think I, there was one point where I thought I, oh, I think I was working on the ribbing. That's right, I was doing the rib bottom. While I was there and yeah I just couldn't I made a mistake and I couldn't see it so I put it down and worked on worked on this yeah so I really love it I'm gonna make more I'm not gonna use linen quill again um, the yarn is fine I'll, I'll know more about how I feel about this yarn uh, one once I've worn it a little bit and you know and I form a a, an, a, a complete image that includes feelings <laughs> um, in my head when I think about the sweater. Because um, I don't know about you, but for me, whether the sweater, the, how I like the sweater has as much to do with the silhouette as it does with the feel and the yarn. Um, so, and the yarn really 
uh, contributes so much to how a sweater feels on your body. Um, but yeah, so far I love the spec. I love that I made the sleeves extra long and they, you know, don't pull up as I'm moving and stuff. And they're, they have lots of, um, ease in the, in the sleeves and stuff. So it really worked out perfectly. Um, as I said, I did make it longer cause it is kind of a cropped and more fitted fit on the model and she also uh paula worked in some short rows in the back like right above the rib which i did not do because i think that's if you're wearing a crop sweater and you you know you want to be able to move without it hiking up i figured i was making it longer so that wasn't going to be a problem for me and i'm glad i didn't because i I worried that maybe there would be something different about the way the neck fit if I didn't put those in, but no, not at all. In fact, the back neck is pretty high. Um, you do a pretty significant, I don't know if you can see, um, let's see if I can get close, a very, pretty significant width, um, I think it's two inches, one by one rib. Um, and if you remember, I messed this up, so I had to rip it all back out and do it over um but yeah i love it love 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 it i was thinking about do i have a swatch here i don't okay <laughs> i was th i actually think because this is sort of fuzzy and has like a warmth factor to it i think it's the alpaca that's in it and i thought it was going to have a drier crisper hand because of the linen but the linen other than texture isn't really um lending in itself to the hand i don't think like it's not i mean there's a visual texture but it fe this yarn feels really fuzzy and soft and squishy like the way a surrey um silk sort of thing would feel so yeah i was thinking about maybe i have i've counted up the other day if i don't count many skeins i have seven seven sweater quantities of superwash <laughs> indie dyed yarn from whatever the last six or so years that i've um since indie dyers pretty much came on the scene so i was thinking i might use one of those like one of those uh sweater quantities to make another one i have um if i remember i couldn't find it this morning quickly i couldn't find it quickly i'm sure i have it here um but I was thinking I have a cream-based um, sweaters quantity that I think would be really pretty. So I may try that um, and just see how the drapeability is. Um, and I also have a... I'm going to grab it. <laughs> I keep trying to get it. Okay. I was going to cast this on my thought as I was working away on this, as soon as I could see that I was really going to like it when I saw the body. Um, I was like, oh, I'm absolutely going to um, cast this on next, this swatch. This is La Bien Aime, um Helix and Kumo held together in the colorway Wisteria. So it's kind of like a a red violet and blue violet um, together with like some gold tones in there and some pale blue. Um, yeah, so I have, let me show it to you out of the bag. How about that? So yeah, I have a sweaters quantity of these. So um, they're both lace weight, but held together, they equal fingering weight. And I, um, that's the Helix, that's the Kumo. The Kumo's a Surrey Silk um, lace weight, and uh, Helix is Corriedale and Falkland Merino. Um, so yeah, I have, I bought, I purchased this last year at some, oh, I don't even remember. I think I was at an event, a virtual event in the summer or spring, late, late summer, something like that. And I purchased it, um, so there was a code, a discount, for um, maybe free shipping or something for pe participants. So I went ahead and purchased it because I really, really wanted to try it. And uh, I love this. I love that it's very spring-like in its color, which is awesome, but it's fuzzy. And I don't really see it as a um, later spring 
sweater where I think the superwash fingering weight you know knitting in a fine gauge using this uses a four using a size four needle I think might be more wearable right now and this would be wearable right right now <laughs> but I don't know I probably won't finish it in time to really make use of it so I, I don't know I'm gonna think about it um, I'm definitely gonna make that yarn in this sweater um, because after I purchased this I really I spent a long time trying to figure out what to make and it just seemed like it just seemed like a lot of people were making simple like cardigans or v-necks and I thought I already have a v-neck pattern and I like the spec so and I, I you know it's it's useful to make the same pattern again because that you know you kind of know you have the you know you have a visual of how it's going to go so yeah so I just was like oh, I'm going to just make what I you know what I what I have been making and, or make the same pattern and just go for it um I did swatch it in uh US size 3 and US size 4. So my swatch has two different sizes. I know I make really small swatches, but they work for me. Um, yeah, so that that is that is the Daily Pullover by Paula Pereira. I really, really love the pattern. Paula's a great designer, very, very thorough in her uh, in the way she crafts um, patterns. Yeah. I also finished the Don't Look Up sweater. <laughs> that is, this is on, that's what Martha is wearing, the Don't Look Up sweater. Um, I really love this sweater too. It's not quite so springy, but if I had finished it like two or three weeks ago, I could have worn it. Um, it's just getting a little bit too warm for thicker sweaters. Um, yeah, so this is the Don't Look Up sweater. It is a wing it pattern. <laughs> um, uh, quite a few people, if you look at the hashtag on Instagram, quite a few people reverse engineered the um, color work from the sweater, the movie Don't Look Up, the um, sweater that Jennifer Lawrence, she wore three different handcrafted uh, or, you know, sweaters that people have deconstructed and or reverse engineered and figured out how to make. I think two of them were crochet and this was um, the knit one, the one knit one that she wore. So yeah, so I used uh, Knitted by Nye's color work charts. She had made the chart and she figured out where to put in the increases, which I kind of followed. I ended up, I think she's now fixed it, um, but I ended up putting a row of increases in just after the neckband. And I did do short rows in the back to keep the back neck up. Um, I think you can see there, just off screen. And then I went right into the color work. And what I did was anytime there was a solid row uh, in the color work, like here and here, I did my increases. Um, yeah, so, and I used a pattern that is from the book Worsted, which is right here. Uh, it's the most recent La Bienna May edited um, book from La Lana Magazine. Lena, Lana, Lena, Lana. You know what I mean, <laughs> magazine. I'm sure you've heard about the book. Um, it's designed around, it's all designs um, that feature Cory Worsted, which is La Bienna May's not newest, but was new a year ago or eight months ago or so. I bought it at Rhinebeck and it was, the book wasn't out, but the yarn was. So she, I think she launched it sometime last summer. But anyway, yeah, I used a pattern. I used yesteryear's pattern by Max Sear, which was another pattern that I had made. And I liked the way it was constructed and, and the um, spec of it, the way that he built the yoke. So I tried to follow that as close as possible. I definitely went with that stitch count and everything um, to get this fit and yeah I really really love it I was so excited to get it done um I did so you do use a significant amount of the black yarn I used up all of the um black yarn that you see here and one of the sleeves this one I had to use a I went and spun this is completely hand spun also um I went and spun a little more 
um, yarn, another like a small amount of yarn, about 20, no, about 40 grams of gray uh, fleece that I had on hand. So just this sleeve from here to here has uh, a different gray black yarn, but um, everything else, it worked out fine. I had spun with the brown. Let me go through them and I'll give you more details. Um, the brown yarn is a natural Poworth color. So it's like sort of a natural sheep, undyed uh, sheep color. And it is from Sea Colors in um, Maine. She's in, in up in Maine. She lives up in Maine. Her farm is in Maine. And I bought a bunch of fleece from her. I think I bought about uh, about a pound. 16 ounces or so. I didn't end up spinning at all because as I, w I was still spinning it when I had already made it pretty much through most of the yoke and I started to think maybe I'm not going to need as much as I thought I did because I was planning to spin about 1200 um, yards or so of a uh, worsted weight or you know heavy DK and I, at the total amount with including this in my hand that I had spun was about 800 yards and I didn't use all of this so um yeah so if you're planning on trying this sweater out just you know keep that in mind I think I, I did an update my Ravelry page to say exactly what the yardage was because I would have to ballpark how much I had left but it's not a lot it's probably about 100 yards or so so maybe 700 yards you could you could do um the pink is, uh, I had plenty of that. I had about a 200, high 200s, like 270 or maybe 300 yards, say, of the pink. Um, and I didn't use it all. In fact, this, I'm holding this green because if, if, if you're new, you won't remember this, but if you were here last week or even, you know, the last couple episodes or two weeks ago in my last episode, you'll know that um, the pink and green were together and uh, it made a gradient um, pink to green skein that was I hand spun from some fiber by uh, Pancake and Lulu um, called Squid Game. It was uh, inspired by the colors in uh, a scene in one of the Squid Game uh, frames. So I started out, um, I just was knitting from the ball without doing any sort of color management. And uh, it had a little dab of blue in the beginning. And then it, you know, went into this like marled pink, um, you know, similar to what you're seeing here. Pink with blue and sometimes bits of green and peach in there. Um, and this was imminent. Like I was about to come upon, um, you can actually see the peach there, peak pink and peach and green. I was about to come upon this when I reached the end of the of the body yoke and then I was like, okay, I'm going to knit one sleeve this sleeve and just see what happens thinking that I would finally get to the green, but I didn't. I just started it. I think you can see a dab there. Um I had just gotten there. And then I had to do that sleeve and that sleeve would have been all green if I had just kept going. So instead I took the green off until I got reached pink again. Cause it was, this skein was, um, a layer of pink, a layer of green, a layer of pink, a layer of green. And so I just spun off the green, wound off the green and, um, until I got to pink so that this sleeve would then also be pink. And yeah, now I have this, these, I don't know what I'll do with them, something, some fun scrap knitting. And the black, I did end up with a little dab of it left. Um, this skein is very much barber pulled. Oh my gosh, come on camera. I think you can see, yeah, there you go. So this skein is very much barber pulled where the other skein of hand spun um, that I spun from Into the World, a, a club color that I got in 2021. Um, it's more heathered. So uh, this yarn I made from a, a bat that was, oh, I have pictures. <laughs> Instead of explaining this, I have video clips I could show you. Um, so I'm gonna show those. Hey, I wanted to give you an update on this project. 
I have finished the color work at the top of the second sleeve, so that's it's um, here on the needles now. Uh, I'll knit about, um, here's the one that I had already finished. So I'll knit in, in just the main color for about five or six inches, and then I start the sleeve color work that's down close to the cuff, and that's basically this pattern right here and then you do the cuff there's a little bit of condensing in terms of oh sorry it has starts with the medallion so you're basically taking this medallion shape and flipping it around so it'll be the two points pointing at each other um so my yarn situation though is looking sort of dire this is all i have left of the gray it's about 20 grams I suspect it's enough for one sleeve, but probably not the second. Um, so I'm going to finish off the spin um, skein that I'm spinning now and work on substitute <laughs> hand spun for this. Um, the pink is looking really good. I have plenty of that. Uh, I still haven't actually used all of the pink from the first section. Uh, so it'll it'll go into the green somewhat, I'm guessing, at some point. So that'll be an adventure of its own. Brown is doing fine. I think I have plenty. I still have one skein uncaked. Um, but just to... Oh, let me keep this handy. Just to show you what I'm dealing with in terms of the spin. I have these three... Sorry if that was a little shaky. <laughs> I have these three chunks of gray blue tones. Um, this one is probably the most off um, because it has pink in it. I don't mind that. I, is, I, it's very small. It's a small amount of pink. Let's see if I can unwind this with one hand. There we go. Yeah, so it's it's mostly this like pale gray. This is spot on. This is great. It's got a little bit of purpley blue in it. Um, it's pretty close to what I originally, um, it has sparkle, but not much. And then I found this too. This is another like mini chunk of like some bluish fleece. Um, yeah. So the idea is to get this. I think, so these are each about 20 grams. I think I probably could get away with two. I really would like to do all three because I think that would give me the most <laughs> yarn, which would be great to not have to worry about yarn chicken. But I think the match is gonna be off because this is so much lighter. Um, Cause I feel like this should be two plies and the other one should be one whichever one I decide to go with. Uh, decisions, decisions, we'll see. So I went with the dark gray and the blue gray only, and I ended up with a very barber pole situation, which looks good when you're looking at it here, but the texture of the hand spun is quite different, the second hand spun than the first one. But we're just gonna make it work. Yes. <laughs> That's how I did it. <laughs> Hopefully that made sense. Yeah, so that's what happened with the black. Um, I do wish I had a blending board. If I had a blending board, this is the first time I've ever wished I had one. Because I've seen people use them and I'm like, I don't really like Rolags. Like, they're okay. I don't, it's not my like, oh yeah, I must spin from those. It's like, okay, that's what that fiber is in and that's, and I like it. I'm going to go ahead and spin it. Because um, Rolags create a woolen spun and I tend to spin in a more worsted fashion or like semi-worsted fashion. Um, Cause I like that. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the, that's the don't look up sweater. I, I'm so pleased with it. It's really, really, again, I think I did a good job on the spec. It's not too short. It's not too um, tight. Um, there's a fair amount of positive ease built in. Sleeves are nice and long. It's all the good things, so. Oh, I have another finished object. 
I also finished my socks at long last. So these are socks that I made out of some hand spun. Um, the hand spun is from Green Goat Ranch and it was called, I think it was called Fairy Godmother. Um, and it was inspired by Disney or a Disney film. It has a little bit of a sparkle in it. I did the Drea Renee Everyday Sock. Um, it's sort of my go-to sock pattern. Um, and I, I didn't have these on the blocker for, for drying because I wanted them to stay nice and um, form-fitting. I just put them on the blockers for, um, uh, for it to show you. Um, I never use blockers for blocking my socks when I first knit them. But um, so what I have found is that some of my socks that are made out of non-superwash wool kind of get a little felty um, from, from wear and stuff and from like repeated washing. And I find the blockers, the reason I got the blockers was to block those uh, already washed and worn socks to get them um, to get, you know, to make sure that they're not gonna be too small. But yeah, I'm so glad these are off the needles. These are, I think I've been working on these since February. And uh, I, at one point I said a couple episodes back, my original thought about this year and my knitting projects was that I would make a pair of socks and a pair and a sweater a month. So sweaters I'm doing fine. These are my third and fourth sweaters. Um, this is my second two and a half pair of socks. I do have a half pair done that I have had done since February which I'm not gonna to talk to you about this week. I will talk to you about it soon though. It's a sock I designed um, and I submitted it for publication and it didn't, I just heard that it did not get accepted so I can now talk about it, but I just, I don't have it and I'm not prepared to um, do all of the things that I need to do to talk about one of my own designs. So it's not, the pattern isn't written or anything. So maybe next, in my next episode or two, I'll have, I'll get to the place where I feel like I can talk about it and also say it's the patterns written, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah. So I actually have almost three pair done, but now that those are done, I can go back to what I was originally thinking I would be knitting all year, uh, a bunch of gift knit socks and DK weight. So, um, I've had the yarn like queued up on the bed over there for <laughs> months since Christmas. Um, and I actually have some here, so I'm hoping now I can get into that knitting and uh, DK socks should go quite a bit faster than um, fingering weight socks. So, plus I'll be motivated because I will have a bunch of them I wanna get, get to uh, this year ahead of all the birthdays and things that start in July in my family. So. Yeah, those are all my finished objects. Uh, I have some new cast-ons because of course I've been, my wheels have been turning all the projects that I wanna make. I have um, such a long list of projects and I wasn't sure what I wanted to make, but um, I was watching Caitlin and Jackie and um, Caitlin was saying that she's gonna cast on me a Kimmy sweater. Um, Jackie made one of these, I think a year or more ago, maybe last summer she made it. Um, yeah, so the Akimi is a pattern by, I'm going to put her name on screen. I think it's a Japanese designer uh, and I don't want to mispronounce her name. Um, it is a pattern from um, Amarusu magazine uh, and it's really, really cute. I love it. So I saw that Caitlin was going to make it and I thought, oh, I'm gonna make one too. I really wanna make one. So I decided to go ahead and cast on and I messaged her and told her that I was casting on too. Um, so I don't, it's not really a knit along, but at least like maybe we can motivate each other a little bit. I don't know who else is also making them along with her. Um, but yeah, this is mine so far. Um, I did not use the yarn that it was recommended. I. Um, understand that a lot of people didn't get gauge with that yarn and I thought well if I'm not gonna get gauge and I'm gonna have to fiddle I may as well I didn't there weren't any colors that really I really really wanted to knit and I, I got really interested in making like a mint green sweater um, 
so I purchased yarn from Moondrake Yarn Company. She has a sport weight Cormo, 100% Cormo, non superwash. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is one of her spring colors. So I just decided to order. So this is yarn I bought <laughs> recently. Um, it came, I caked it and cast on. I, well, I swatched and um, I swatched right away and then cast on. And I got gauge with this yarn uh, for this pattern. So I don't think it's quite as heavy as uh, the yarn that the pattern was designed for, but I think it's fine. I'm gonna knit, I'm knitting to uh, the fit the the way the pattern intended not the way that Jackie's fit because Jackie's if you watch her I'll put a picture here she it was very fitted on her like less positive ease I want more positive ease and that that's sort of a seems to me like in looking at Japanese fashion that's a bit uh a more like more positive ease is is um more of a Japanese style aesthetic so um, yeah, so I uh, this is it so far. I've got like maybe four inches of the yoke. Um, and what you do with this pattern, you knit in the round top down, um, do a bunch of short rows, which you can see kind of peeking out actually here on this side right here. And uh, then you start doing um, textured stitches. So it's got three different textured stitches. Um, and you do, you know, oh no, it's got more than that. It's got like maybe five different textured patterns. So it's like knit in a solid colored yarn um, in with textured stitches. So, and it has a little fringe detail that goes around um, towards the bottom of the yoke. So I did read that a lot of people didn't like where that fringe fell on their body. like. Um, cause ideally I think it should probably, you know, go right, a, right across like here, no lower on me, like no lower than here, like not, you wouldn't want it on the apex of your bust and a few people it either fell there or it fell lower than that. You would really want it high on the higher, like right, no lower than where this pink line, that pink line is. So I'm going to be paying attention to that, um, for my fit because I absolutely do not want it on the apex. I have a massive bust for my small rib cage that I don't I don't want to emphasize. <laughs> so, and I've been toying around with how big, how long to make that because you can make it as long or as little as you want. And I was thinking I was going to do I think they say about an inch um long. I, I some people definitely went longer. I was thinking a half inch, but no one really did such a tiny little fringe. So I'm going to, I'm going to mess around with it when I get there. Um, it's a ways away and I can see why, like after reading the instructions, why it takes so long. People complain also that they're, that doing that fringe takes a really, really long time because you're knitting it in. So you're knitting it stitch by stitch and yeah, it's a lot. But fun, a fun pattern, and it's going fast because it's it, even though it's sport, it's knitting like a DK, so it's really, really going fast. All right, I have another new cast on um, that. Uh, yeah, this is a cardigan. Um, this is the DAA cardigan by Isabel Kramer. I love Isabel Kramer's patterns. Um, I like the way she does her spec as well. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty fun. I am going to actually put in a clip here where I'm going to talk to you about the yarn and then I'll bring you back and show you the, the pattern. I thought I would show you these mini skeins, um, this way instead of trying to hold them up to the camera one by one or gather them together this was just an easier way for you to see what this project is uh there is one full skein so this is the 12 day advent uh calendar from granui um i think the i can show you here it's her 1815 base so there it is uh, she is a Canadian dyer, 
yeah, so 85 superwash, 15% nylon. Um, all of them are the same. Uh, this is the full skein that we opened on the last day. And then these aren't in the order that I opened them. This is just in the order in which I knit them, starting uh, here and going this way and then this row. And then I'm working on these four. And then the um, full skein will be the 13th stripe. So I am knitting the DAA cardigan by Isabel Kramer. And uh, the, yeah, these are the first eight colors, uh, working on the ninth color right here. Um, but I just love the way they went together and I felt like they should be together in some project. Um, and yeah, I really, really love the way it is coming out. I think it'll be a really nice transition, um, transitional piece for the transition seasons, for the shoulder seasons, as we like to say. Um, some people like to say, I guess, <laughs> but yeah, isn't it lovely? Can't wait to get all the colors striped and stuff and the yoke done and all of that. Okay. So yeah, so this is, I'm making it out of these mini skeins out of my, uh, advent, advent calendar. I learned about this pattern and about, um, knitting with a bunch of mini skeins from watching Cozy Cardigans, Mel of Cozy Cardigan, who just had a baby. She's also the owner of Big Little Yarn Co. Um, and yeah, she's on maternity leave now, but she's been working on, she got the, uh, Grinui mini a skein advent calendar in 2021 as well. Uh, she got the 24 day. I only got the 12 day and yeah, I was watching her knit on hers and I was like, Oh, it's such a great idea. Um, cause the pattern is written for it to be solid or two color stripe, but there's no reason why you couldn't do a multicolor stripe. So I think this is going to be really, really fun. It has a really cute detail down the back. That's the center back. So there's like this knit pearl detail. And then you do, there's also a detail that um, you, you really can't see too much of, but there is like sort of this faux seaming detail um, along the sleeves. Yeah, you really can't see it next time. I'll show you that more next time. So yeah, I'm going to be repeating the colors. It's 13 colors, so it'll be 13 stripes. I'm just going to repeat the color striping pattern um, unless I run out of one color or the other, or another. But I mean, in, the yardage is fine. I have more than enough yarn in terms of the yardage that was called for in the pattern. So um, yeah, this will be fun. I just really love the way the colors look together. It'll be a nice um, transitional piece. Superwash. Superwash. So I wear like superwash cardigans in the summer a lot because of the air conditioning um, that we tend to do in this area. It's very hot outside, but air conditioning inside. So little um, fingering weight superwash sweater is perfect. The perfect uh, weight and warmth factor for, for that. Yeah, that's all my knitting. Um, like I said, I'm planning to cast on another pair of socks soon. And, oh, the um, just to close the loop on this pattern, the pure mesh tee that I was working on, I did rip it all out, but I hadn't, I haven't gotten around to casting it on again. Um, I did, I was saying that I was going to rip it out because I thought I had um, made it too big because I was knitting the biggest size since I, I went down like four needle sizes. So I was knitting the biggest size to, to compensate for going from knitting a smaller stitch um, gauge. So I, um, I then started thinking about like, I think I wanted rib, I want to do a rib bottom. So I did rip it all out. I measured it. I was, the size was fine. I could have continued. Um, but now at least I can put ribbon. So I have that, I have it all prepped over on the bed. I just need to move that forward. So I'll, I'll do that soon um, in the next few days, maybe tomorrow even. Um, yeah, and uh, I might cast on another one of these, another daily pullover, we'll see, we'll see. I have a tiny bit of spinning. Um, after I, I, uh, did recorded last episode, I took my spinning wheel. I usually have it by the couch, which you've seen in clips. 
Um, so, and so I can watch TV or watch a movie or whatever while I'm spinning. It takes me about, just in case you're wondering how long it takes to spin, it takes about an hour or so to spin a skein, maybe a little longer. Um, but I can, I can spin an entire bobbin in less than an hour, um, one bobbin, and then you, you need at least two bobbins to make a skein. So plying takes l less time than that. So I decided to move my spinning wheel over into my home office and put it next to my desk so that when I reach a point in the work I'm doing where I'm waiting for someone to get back to me on, on or multiple someones to get back to me on stuff, or I am just taking a break, a pause from whatever I'm doing, instead of like mindlessly scrolling on my phone, I can just turn and spin some yarn a little bit and like even if it's just five or ten minutes so uh, and then I can I can also read if I have a document I need to read on my screen I can look at my computer screen that's right next to me and um, view it read while I'm spinning so that's been nice I have been doing a I would say a little bit more spinning it's been it's it's been really nice for my work day I mean, I can easily, my spinning wheel is very portable and my office and living room are right next to each other. So I can bring it, bring it back over into the living room in the evening if I wanted to spin. But I seem to be getting like that spinning itch scratched by having it um, there. And what, one of the perks is that I sit higher when I'm at the, at my desk than I do on the couch. So I can see better, like over the top of the whirl and see what's happening on the bobbin a little easier from my desk desk chair. So that's kind of nice. Do you like that? And sometimes I just sit there to spin instead of like even do, you know planning to do any work, I'll just go sit go over there and sit and spin. Um but yeah, so I have been still working on my Outlander spin, which is a total of 4 skeins, so I'm halfway done. Um I showed this one last time. This is a uh, blue green out of the blue green skein so it was basically it was um to recap what it is it was a fiber advent or countdown it wasn't really an advent that uh was intended to be counted down from christmas day and through new year's um or actually through january 6th but i didn't get it in time to do that so i just put it aside and opened it for my birthday instead and my birthday's in february so i just did a countdown to my birthday which was fun um Yes, yeah, so it was 13 uh, fibers, so uh, 12 that were one ounce, Polworth silk blends, all Polworth silk blends, all inspired by Outlander. And then there was a full braid, a four ounce braid at the end. Um, so yeah, I finished this one. So this was from last time. I just brought it along to show you with this one. So this one I had said to you, it was a little more autumnal. I think I showed um, a video clip of the fiber. I really, really love the way it came out. It's beautiful. So because they're, each skein is made up of four different colors, um, there's quite a lot of um, barber pulling and heathering going on um, in, the, in the skein. It's really, really pretty. So yeah, these are the two I have so far. This blue-green one was really more of an outlier from the other three. The other three looked like they were going to go together um, and because the the one I'm spinning now has a quite a lot of the blue in it um, and it doesn't have this orangey rust color in it um, it has instead a significant amount of more red tones I would say so it's got a lot of blue and red and white there's this white white um, that that has come up in some of the fibers. So we'll see what that looks like I'm sure it'll be pretty I and I don't need to use them together it's fine. I don't. I don't mind having um, single skeins of hand spun because there's always something to make with them, or they make good gifts too. So that is all the spinning I have done. I'm about halfway done with the other skein, uh, with the third skein of this Outlander series, and um, then I'll do the fourth skein, which is predominantly red. And I'll be done with that project. And my next spin project is going to be spinning a bunch of tonal skeins, putting together old advents from 2020 and 2021, um, and just put mushing together 
by color. So like all the pinks, all the blues, all the greens, uh, and creating like sort of a Frankenstein mixture of these um, small quantities to get. Yeah, I, I added it all up. It's about a thousand grams and it should get me 10 skeins, but we'll see. Probably won't be 10. Um, that counted this gray. That was counting this gray. So I already have one of the 10, so I'll probably have nine uh, or so, maybe a little less, depending on how the color separates. So we'll see, that'll be fun. I really wanna get to that because those are gonna be two ply. Uh, what I'm doing now are three ply skeins and it just takes longer because you're doing three, bo three bobbins to get the finished um, skein. I just wanted to share a couple quick things um, that I didn't share in, in the recording of this episode. So since I'm um, going into editing now, I figured I would just say I'm here. Um, I have been thinking about doing a, a holiday box with hand spun yarn. So it would be yarn that I, that it'll, it would be based on the theme with my hand spun yarn and other things other products i was just wondering i'm trying to gauge interest it would be very limited because i don't uh have a huge amount of time to spend but if i were to put a pre-order up and i knew exactly how many skeins i was making i think i could um you know get it done get get the work done um yeah so i've been toying with that idea i just wanted to kind of gauge interest i'm going to you know depending on the reaction i get from my viewers i may um create a poll because i have all kinds of questions about like how much yarn is a good amount of yarn and how and other things do you want just yarn or would you do you like a, like a curated box? Um, it won't be a countdown. It'll just be a box that you can put under the tree or save for Hanukkah or um, other gift giving occasions. And um, yeah, it's that it would be that type of thing. But yeah, it would be centered around a theme. Uh, I would work with a, a fiber dyer to uh, dye based on the theme. And then I would spin the yarn and you would get spun yarn. Um, with other stuff I'm thinking like maybe a ceramic piece um, stitch markers things like that like extra little it would be like a comfort and joy box um, yeah so just something I, I've been thinking about I definitely don't need another project to cer certainly right now like I'm barely hanging on with the, the end of the semester coming there's a I feel like I am tr constantly trying to catch a train running out of the station right now and uh but it's gonna pass i'll be i'll be you know all this all that will be behind me by mid-may so i would then have energy for something different and new uh yeah anyway i'll talk more about it in in the upcoming episode um but if you are interested and you want to leave me a comment um about that that would be great you could just do that down below um and then maybe next time i'll have a survey or poll ready um to ask some of the questions about you know all the things, <laughs> all the things that I need to know in order to set specifics for the box. The last thing that I wanted to share with you that I didn't is uh, I did purchase Advents. I know some, I talk a lot about Advents. I've talked a lot about them, the, you know, around Advent time and also, or countdown calendars, whatever is, you know, a culturally appropriate word for you. Um, yeah, so I did purchase, I have, I have ordered, I may, might not have shared all of this, so I just figured I'd recap for you. I ordered a 12 day fiber calendar from Akara Yarns and she's a Canadian dyer. Uh, I had gotten a 12 day from her for, for 2021 and I liked it very much. And she's centering this time around one fiber, which is right up my alley because one fiber means I can uh, use, all of that together I can spin it you can of course you can spin mixed wools as well but it's just you get more consistent yarn if you're using one one fiber so it's a 12 day single fiber um, based on a theme and I think she's doing a coordinating color palette so uh, yeah 
Great. Perfect. Um, yarn wise, I went ahead and bought Grinui's uh, Advent this year again because I really, really like the one I got last year and I like her color sense. She is doing, I, she's only doing 24 days. So I went, I went for the 24 day. It is a, um, it's a lunar based theme and she's doing a, a fade. So the colors will, I'll be able to group them. So if I do two sets of 12, uh, they'll, they'll work together. Um, and I purchased one other mini skein. Um, you, you all know I was trying to find a non superwash mini skein set. Um, and, uh, my cat has allergies. He's got the sniffles. He's so cute. Sniffling over there. Um, anyway, I, you know, I was, I was talking about a superwash or non superwash, um, really wanted to know about those. So I bought a 12 day, um, non superwash Coriadale, uh, set from Sakimi yarn in Scotland. So that's exciting. So I'm excited to see what those look like. I also like the colors that I saw on their website. So I think I'm all set with yarn. Um, I might buy one more fiber calendar. If Green Goat Ranch does one, I've, I say this all the time, if Green Goat Ranch does one, I won't be able to resist. I must buy, I must buy her fiber calendar because she's my spinning godmother. So I feel like I, you know, I always, I like to support her work and um, her goat farm and stuff. So yeah. Um, so I will definitely t pick up her. So I'm sort of just keeping an eye open if there's another 12 day or less, or 10 day, eight day, seven day, whatever um, fiber calendar, I'd be interested in that. Um, but I do, I am very interested in it being a single fiber for all of the days and um, the colors being thematic um, centered around, you know, a certain palette instead of being like a hodgepodge of colors so that I could potentially put them together in a, um, project. So yeah, that's my update on my advents. I'm also very, I feel really good about what I got and I don't have any desire to bring any more in, especially because I'm trying to do a low buy year and I'm doing so good right now. Doing really good. <laughs> uh, Back to your regular show now. <laughs> okay, so I have been finishing up my episodes this year so far with a little mini lesson on allyship and how to be a uh, how to how to be a good ally. And I think I've reached. I have made a list of what I could do, and I think I've made I've reached the end of the things that I can do for um, in segment in sort of standalone brief little segments of um of this so i was thinking so actually please tell me if there's anything that you want me to talk about about that i'd, I'd be happy to try to work something in or work something out um so yeah that would be that would be really helpful for me um but for this segment what i was thinking i could do sort of shift tones and topics, I thought I could address some knitting myths. And I have a few ideas of what um, knitting myths, some knitting myths that just bug me. Like, so what, what I have, I'm an academic. Um, I work in a university. I teach classes and all of that jazz. And um, I'm really accustomed to reviewing what data says about a problem instead of looking at like instead of someone saying well I heard blah, 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 you know of course we all love that I love that too but usually you know but if you're if it's something that you're actually going to do something about or it Im impacts you in any way it's useful to look at the data to really understand what's being said so I have some pet peeves about people that talk about some some folks or when I hear something that's been said about yarn or about fiber or about knitting that isn't well researched or doesn't have any it's a myth so I would kind of think of it as a myth about yarn or about knitting I think it's useful to remember that yarn technology has been around for thousands of years. <laughs> that this, the hum humans have been making yarn for 
ever practically um, out of whatever they could find. Um, and when the Industrial Revolution happened in the late 1800s and went on through um, the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, there was an explosion of scientific data that was gathered throughout like, you know, the 20th century basically. And it pretty much reached a peak in the late 50s, 60s, and kind of like petered off in the 70s and 80s. And there's still, of course, there's still research being done in textiles and such like that, uh, scientific research being done. Um, but a lot of the, there's not a lot to, I mean, research does have a bottom. It's not infinite. So when they reach the bottom, there's not really anything else to, <laughs> to look at anymore. Um, other than to just do the same old experiments over and over. So, um, when I hear weird things about yarn and about knitting, I'm just like, really? Where'd you hear that? That doesn't make any sense to me. And then sometimes I'll go look for uh, the data on it and see if there's any data that backs up whatever the person's saying. So now that you know all of that, I'm interested in knowing what myths you've heard or things you've heard that uh, you might be interested in learning whether or not there's actually any science behind that myth. So let's call it the science behind the myth. <laughs> And I will, um, time permitting, of course, will research and come back to you with answers on the science behind the myth. If there is any science, sometimes there isn't. Sometimes you re I've reached dead ends. Um, so I want to talk about those. I'm not going to do it today. Instead, I'm just going to direct you to a Google form that I have created um, where you can tell me about a myth you heard and you're interested in the science behind it. And I will do my best to dig into it and get to the bottom of it and then report back um, in, a, in a 10 minutes or less segment at the end of my next few episodes. And let's see how it goes. All right. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for spending time with me. I really love this um, platform for, you know, the information that we can share and exchange and support each other and provide, you know, comfort to each other when it's, when it's needed. And yeah, all those, all the wonderful things that come with, um, being part of the knitting community. It's been really, really awesome. And yeah, I hope you well stay safe and I will speak to you again very, very soon. Bye.